Happy Monday, everybody. Yo! Yo. What's up, folks? Oh. Thunderstorms and 295 degrees Kelvin here in Austin, Texas. Wait, how much Kelvins? 295. <laughs> that's, that's not, that's, that, sounds, that sounds like a lot of Kelvin. Sounds like we're all melting, right? That's uh, what started off as a bit where me was mocking Google for doing a geeky thing. Turns out to me to be me like unironically just living in Kelvin's. Like, oh yeah. <laughs> You're now in the Kelvin timeline. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Release the Kelvin cut. <laughs> yeah. Think like Zack Snyder is like, yeah, we're gonna release the Zack Snyder cut. He's like, the what? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think to some degree, yeah. Uh, He's like looking through his iPhone photo album, like, God, I gotta find some footage or something, because like people think there's something here, and oh. Well, and the fact, you know, like, I think you were saying this, Justin, is like that you know, a bunch of the effects that they had planned, they never made because they cut them. Yeah, yeah, they totally restructured. Uh, restructured the story uh and i think that was part of it is like all right well we'll save on doing these effects or like these like heavy cgi things and just go in another direction and now they're gonna go back in the same direction because streaming's now a thing and they have a platform to launch so like i mean i in in Beyond the debate of whether or not it's good, it's a good idea to have the Snyder cut released. Like I can understand if you look at it from like, all right, all these actors have become bigger stars in the intervening couple years. If we had an original series starring all these people, it would be a big deal on any streaming series. Uh, all right. Who's Elon Musk's neighbor? <laughs> Wait, what happened? Oh, I don't know. A Is car that... peeled out in oh, somebody's yeah, microphone. Yeah, no, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't know who. Yeah. Yeah, they're picking up Andrew's trash. Oh, maybe. is that what it is? Okay. In my mind, oh, I, just oh, got... I thought it was oh, it was Bryce, Elon Musk I... for some reason having a combustion engine sidecar. I thought I thought yeah. that was Bryce playing a sound effect while I was talking about the Snyder Cut, and I'm like, "What are you trying to say about this Snyder Cut conversation?" Take out that track. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know if it was because every yeah, I thought Bryce was deliberately playing a sound effect. Oh, no. oh that's great. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. Well, I I brought my input debt level down to see if that helps. You're good. You're good. All right. Uh, yeah, I have a very busy street next to me. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got friends. On oh, the I guess, I guess, yeah. Now, now you're closer to the street on your in your in your new place. Oh yeah, sense. I'm closer to the street, to every fight, to every car accident. I'm here at 4 a.m. I heard a car I like this wow crash. So I put on my shoes, put on my hat, and my mask. This is 4 a.m. Like I run outside. Yeah. And two girls had managed to wedge their BMW in between a Mercedes and another car, like two parked cars. And this is like just right between them, Ooh. tearing off the bumpers and up on the curb. That's a fun night. I'm like, I'm like, how did you pull this one off? Like, I'm used to that intersection. Like, I've seen cars flipped over on the roof. I've watched cars go hit the tree. And I'm usually like, you know, the guy that's like, somebody should do something. I'm somebody, you know, and yeah. so I'm usually the first one running out there like, hey, are you OK? Whatever. And here I'm like, how did you do this? You know, like and I'm on the phone with with 911, like, oh, like, don't call. I'm like, you just totaled two cars. <laughs> like, yeah, you're like I'm not going to wait for you to call your fixer, you know, mm -hmm. so it's just. Oh, jeez. Right. Jeez, I was Louise. Walk, went for a walk with my buddy Peter. We go up on the corner and we hear this car pull out in front of the Smart and Final and go frump and crash right into like a parked car as he was trying to hit the front of the store. It's like, <laughs> oh my oh, god, I'm crazy. like a magnet for this. Oh. <laughs> uh, all right, we because we got a little started. You guys want to or got, got a yeah. little late? You guys want to start the show? Ready, ready. Let's go. Yep. All right, I'll count you in. In three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. Mr. Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. Mr. Justin Robert Young. Hi, friends. How are you? Can you all feel the excitement 
Are you palpitating? Uh, well, what, what, what's I'm funny is like there are yeah. so many legit moments over the last week that I've thought, uh, "Ooh, Andrew's gonna like this." <laughs> that, that I don't know which uh, which of them they are. Is is it about the name change of Elon Musk's child to Roman oh, numerals? I don't care about that. Uh, that's, <laughs> Sorry, that's, that's just okay. So it's not uh, that. Uh, uh, is is it the fact that SpaceX is about to send America's first uh, American astronauts launching from America? since forever spacex slash nasa uh yes exciting if you go to the spacex website they actually have a beautiful graphic and they show you what they want the uh the launch should look like and so this is going to happen as we record this this is monday this is set for wednesday the 27th of may is returning human space flight to the united states man uh so nervous <laughs> i want to say i'm just excited but but we're but, nervous <laughs> yeah who <but, ooh> boy <laughs> uh i certainly hope so everything I'm, goes I'm, off without a hitch yeah i'm actually friends with the alternate uh chell lindgren he's the uh he's the guy if one of those guys decides they get like you know weak in the knees they can't do it chell's the one that's gonna go like all right i guess i got this so wow. uh, I haven't I haven't even bothered Chell right now to see how he's what, what's going on with that. Oh, know? my God. But, uh, we're watching the uh, the animation right now. And of course, they're just stepping out of a Model X completely already in their spacesuits. This is amazing. Yeah, they did the amazing graphics to show this. And uh, uh, even like even the, yeah, the walkway and the uh, the the support tower are like nice and polished and shined up like they're not like utilitarian like the nasa ones you see are it's like its own monolith how, how yeah much if you go that, take a look uh, wait, uh, sorry sorry um i i wonder like part of me wants to mock how nice everything looks and how cool their design is but truthfully we live in an age where uh you know to 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 investors it's it's like it's it's you could have a PC of going to space uh, over in Kazakhstan, or you can have a Mac of going to space uh, right here in America with SpaceX. Well, and and that's yeah. the, the the issue. The issue is uh, that we've been paying, you know, a uh, uh, diamond encrusted Mac prices for PC for a parts. PC, yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, for for decades now. Uh, that if you look at the fact that this is supposed to be the budget option right like oh like we're involved in this because it's cheaper <laughs> like it's going to be uh, a lot it's going to save us money and yet it looks like it it, can't, it it's it's the the bigger brother of the robot from wally -E. so yeah a, a kind of two things to think about are like the launch tower that they've had for the sls right which they, apparently they had to rebuild costs over a billion dollars a billion dollars is how much they spent for the launch tower for that which is more than like the entire development cost like spacex has spent on most of their stuff there was a story and i mentioned this before but it's worth repeating when you have your 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 rocket on the platform and you've got your satellite inside that nose cone it gets hot inside of there so you want to keep it cool you want to ventilate it and so when spacex went to do their first launches they go ask their friends at nasa like well what do we do like oh we go hire from this company they build these air conditioning systems they're like 20 million dollar systems or whatever but they keep the things cool and spacex is like all right let's take a look and they're like it's an ac unit with the tube it pumps air into there I'm like yeah then we pay like 20 million or whatever you know, millions whatever and spacex like what if we use an industrial air conditioning unit that we'd use on top of like i don't know a walmart no like i don't know we haven't tried that so spacex gets an industrial air conditioning unit and a big hose puts it in there guess what and <laughs> we saved millions of dollars because we just didn't assume you know we had to spend millions you know it was just insane insane that that is one of those things where it's like you you can't know what you don't know and and mm. uh, who uh in the structure of a, a monopolar nasa kind of enterprise you know oh. let, let's say an, an apollo program or whatever like nobody becomes the hero for going out and trying something crazy like that and then saving a few rounding errors uh, at the bottom of the budget, but, uh, but, but I, I, I don't know. I, I, we've made it pretty clear. We're pretty big fans. Uh, it's, I, I love hearing stories of this, but here's the scary part when it comes to a world of possibly what could look like kind of cut rate budget solutions to so whatever, like, uh, 
all that boils down to is do they go up safely and come down safely and do they keep going up safely and coming down safely yeah and it's it's a matter of figuring out you you have to ask why we do a thing not to say oh it's dumb you know if you said oh we're just going to use regular aluminum and then you find out no it won't survive in vacuum and cold and you're all of your your all your stuff like cold weld together you're screwed and there's a lot of stuff that learned you know spacex lost a vehicle because they had an interior strut was made from a grade of steel that was not the aircraft grade steel which they had been led to believe that caused a problem and there are and it's trying to figure out when do you need to be diligent and make sure when is it not you know whatever and, and like you said often and just in you know when you're doing cost plus accounting you just go well yeah we'll pay 10 million for it <laughs> you know we'll pay 10 million for a fifty thousand dollar air to unit uh, all right, let me let me ask uh, in terms of the mission because by the time that we do our next episode it will have been done. This is going to put a crude capsule up into space and then does it do anything up there before coming down? Docks at the International Space Station. Docks with the ISS. Okay. So so I assume this is an unloading uh, uh, they're leaving the uh the attending astronauts on the ISS and it's coming home uh with or without people. Well, it's going to stay up there with the crew, and then when it's time for the crew to return, they'll get back into it and return. Oh, wow. So it's not even like a refuel run where it's like, get up, drop it off, head on back home. It's like it's uh, like it's kind of just an extra room for a while. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I, I've seen a number of articles, and we've talked about them before. The, uh, the two astronauts themselves who are going up are, are seasoned professionals who both have been up before. Uh, I believe one of them, or maybe both of them, uh, were on the very last space shuttle uh, missions. Um, uh, they seem to have an easy friendship, and uh, there was, uh, man, some article that used the word slightly goofy, which kind of made me instantly fall in love with them. <laughs> yeah, they these are guys that have just worked together under complete and total pressure and are able to handle that. And, you know, and it's, it's funny because they're all older than us. You know, these guys are, are, you know, senior experienced, you know, astronauts. And it's often when you go look at who does a lot of the testing. I remember when like Virgin or when, you know, when it was uh, Spaceship One, when they did the first test of that, you looked at the ast the guy who piloted that was like 60 some years old. Yeah. Uh, and it just uh, shows you. Yeah. Was it Bert, Bert Rutan was the pilot or the designer of that? He, he was the uh Rutan um, was one of the engineers on that. It was his company, but uh, he has since passed. But yeah, but 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 that was he he was not the pilot. It was somebody else. No 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 no. Got it. No. Yeah, Man, he was the creator I, I, of scale composites. I'm, yeah. I'm I'm so cautious in using any words at all because I'm just so worried for. But I'm sorry, he's still alive. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, sorry. I'm thinking of Paul McCready. I apologize, but Rutan's very much alive. Okay. All right. <laughs> As I said that, I'm like, nope, I got the wrong guy. Let me let me Wikipedia this so I don't <laughs> but, really announce. But it. Here's the important thing: is I'm afraid to say literally anything about this mission outside of. I very much hope it goes well. I hope it goes well for uh, the company SpaceX. I hope it goes well for the living humans who are pilots for the whole thing. I hope it goes well for the ISS. I hope all of us come out the other side feeling like champions because unlike the awesome stunt flex of, of you know, a triple landing of, of uh, first stage boosters and throwing a, a car with a dummy in it in space and all that stuff, all that stuff is like, if it works, it'll be great. If not, whatevs. This is not a whatevs moment. Like I'm feeling a emotional attachment to this mission that both for what it means for the United States and humanity and for SpaceX and for the people who are in there. Well, well and, and, I think, yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, the big thing here is that compared to the demonstration, uh, if that goes wrong, you know, Elon Musk gets dunked on. Um, it becomes a bit of a meme. But then the next time they try it and it works, it's like, oh, okay, look, that was trial and error. Um, obviously, whenever you put, whenever humans are involved, this is going to be a different, uh, a different story. But in general, what this uh, represents is like a a a tendril. Like you don't know it's possible until you see it. This has been a process that has been a long time coming, uh, and. Once it happens and it successfully happens, you know, that's a genie out of the bottle moment. And I, I suppose you're right, Justin, in that if, if it doesn't go well, heaven forbid, um, it won't be the end. It will be a delay that will make all of us very sad and uh, for good reason. But 
Um, Why are you even going there right now? Why are you even going there? Because I just finished a six hour watch through of The Last of Us, which spoiler alert <laughs> ends with somebody deliberately uh, uh, refusing to sacrifice <laughs> that's, a life that's, for that's, humanity. Well, welcome to melancholy thing. I mean, I'm just I'm scared. This is this is the I kind know, of thing. I, this, is this is the kind of go. thing you say when you're scared you're, for you're other heroic beings. You're writing the president's other speech right yes, now. Yes, I am. Because which is. Is why that's a responsible thing to do is to think through what if it doesn't go great and think inside your head brian <laughs> sorry Daddy, i have no I'm internal gonna, dialogue I'm to ride my bicycle should your head hit the pavement and your brain spill out of the side you can get by with half of a brain. Now we'll have to spoon feed you pudding, See? but you like pudding. I'm, I'm picking up you what like... you're putting down, Andrew. Finally, you're talking my language. <laughs> um, you know, SpaceX has been doing some of the military launches have been ones where if you're looking for an equivalent launch where the amount of pressure and what they're doing, because those payloads are ridiculously expensive. And so, you know, it, it's a yeah, there's there's a category of launch where Elon's like, ha ha, it may explode. Not saying that about this one. Yeah. 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 A lot of baby tweets instead. <laughs> a lot of like, yeah. you know what I value more than anything? Humanity. Look at my yep. baby. We just renamed him to comply with California law. Thanks, <laughs> law, for refusing to let us put a number in our child's name. <laughs> Oh boy. So uh it's exciting. Go check out. There's going to be a lot of coverage on this. There's gonna be like uh I think there's like a I think Discovery Channel, somebody's gonna be doing a special leading up to it and sort of some background on it. And uh hopefully, you know, we'll get a clear launch day and we'll get a launch. And that'll be exciting. It'll be like a backup day. And you know, it's yeah. it's cool. What's neat? You know, I, I think what's what's super exciting about this is that uh, when it is successfully completed is to know what's next. I mean, that that's really to, I mean, like, again, talk about like what it's not real until you do it. And once it's done, which I, I mean, when this is, then it's like, Oh, Holy crap. Like now, now we're cooking, not only in the short term, but then also we can start thinking long-term. Yeah. It's cool. As if you go look on the SpaceX website, you can start to see, uh, um, the, they have the, if you look here for the human spaceflight ride share and whatnot, like you can actually call somebody up and say how much for one of these. I found out I put away some Bitcoin a while ago and now I want one. Ha! That's amazing. Uh, I suppose, um, uh, uh, it, it's almost like a, like a joke in the extreme couponing world of like, uh, you can go anywhere as long as you don't care where you're going. Uh, there's kind of a version of that where it's like, uh, I would imagine that you pay a lot less money if you don't care when your flight is and where it's going and what the purpose is. <laughs> like, I just want to go to space. If, if you go to the human space flight thing and you scroll down, there is a thing that says, for inquiries about our private passenger program, contact sales at SpaceX. That's awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> If if you have to ask how much, you can't afford it. Uh, I don't know. I think this is kind of the reverse. They're definitely putting up retail pricing on the website. Yeah. Oh no 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 not for the personal, uh, the the personal ride. Like you buying that, that's definitely market price. You have to just say you want to do it, and then they hit you with a with a bill afterward. Uh, yeah, like, uh, it's so funny because like, you know, everything's negotiable and it's like, uh, even going to space. Cause I guarantee you, you get, you get your name on that list and they say, well, it's, uh, $10 million to go up. And you're like, nope, too much. And they're like, okay, goodbye. Ring, ring. You won't believe it. My manager, he just hit me up. He said, <laughs> we got quotas this quarter <laughs> and I'm not supposed to do this, but 2.5 million dollars now you have to hold a cube sat in your lap <laughs> all right listen final thing look i swear i'm about to get fired from spacex i could let you go for nine hundred and ninety eight thousand dollars <laughs> now mind you you might die uh, yeah. There's a chance that you're gonna die it's an Death experimental is a possibility <laughs> you, you are to gonna have to suit. understand 
<laughs> now, what's the, what's the problem is, is, is that you don't you, you don't have the cash right now. We have financing options. Let me get Gary over in financing. Hold on. Hello, <laughs> SpaceX financing. It's Gary. Of course he works in financing. <laughs> uh, of course he all does. All right, listen. What if they converted their house into space coins? Uh, what, 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 what could we work with here? I'm sorry, good sir. I'd like to pay for this space flight, but I already gave all my money to patreon.com slash weird things. That's the most responsible investment I've heard this entire program. We've finally remembered it. Patreon.com slash weird things is where you gotta go to support this very show. Uh, uh, folks, we're trying to do our best to keep this uh, going. We're doing this on a Memorial Day. We're working on a holiday just for you. Patreon.com slash weird things get your custom rss feed and get the after things podcast before anybody as soon as it goes live it goes live to you patreon.com slash weird things gentlemen do you guys uh like pac-man i mean sure, what's, yeah. not, what's not the love about him outside of the fact that his name was almost puck man and the only reason it's not puck man is because people figured out that it's easy for teenagers to scrape off part of a p and make a different word well, there's that. There's that. So, uh, Pac Man, uh, Pac Man turned like what forty, like forty years old. Like, um, Pac Man's been around. That 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 tracks. Sadly, because I remember being five years old when the Pac Man craze hit. <laughs> no, it looks like uh, the in July is the fortieth anniversary for the Japanese release of Pac Man. Did you guys oh, ever watch the uh, Pac Man cartoon where they made him like a Mario guy, like a guy who had a wife and kids and so on? Oh, yeah. No, that was, <laughs> it was part of the USA block. USA had their own, uh, like the God, something Saturday morning, like a uh, uh, block, but it was a little off brand. It was a little K Marty. It definitely wasn't the network cartoons and it wasn't the like nickelodeon or disney channel cartoons that's but. so interesting because i wonder if this is a different generation of it because i'm thinking of like around 82 i want to say i thought it was a cbs thing but but i might be wrong on that too oh no th yeah i think i saw a either maybe, not made a version, maybe it was like a syndication or this version. was just the syndication of it yeah, yeah. it might have been but that's where I yeah. remember seeing well, and it. And then I remember later they, they came out with like a video game version of the cartoon version of the video game. Oh, yeah. The Pac-Man Extended Universe is a very <laughs> real thing. <laughs> the PCEU or PMEU. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, NVIDIA decided to do a thing where they built an AI. One of the things we're working out in AI is it's one thing to develop an artificial intelligence system or neural network that does a task. Now they're trying to work towards ones that can solve a lot of problems. You know, AlphaGo was a system that learned how to play Go. AlphaGo Zero was a system that basically learned the rules itself and could then learn other games. And they've had different systems now, and there's another paper out about a system that learned how to play a bunch of different games, even complicated games, working its way up. What NVIDIA did here was they built an AI that was able to watch the game of Pac-Man over and over again and then generate its own version of it. So I've only gone as far as reading the headline. And I, if I remember correctly, it was like 80,000 games or something. But after some amount of watching Pac-Man long enough, the AI was able to say, all right, I get it. There's a maze aboard. It looks like this. There are dots in these locations. There's a packing thing. There's a ghost thing. When this gets hit, the ghosts turn blue. They become eatable. Um, the part that I'm so curious to know is, uh, I assume from the headline that along with that, a human is able to control and play it. And like, like I, 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 uh, I suppose maybe watching a game probably includes not just watching the game screen itself, but also watching the inputs from a joystick or whatever. Uh, do you think that was in there? Uh, um, that's actually a good question. And they, uh, by I, the way, I, this welcome to a person who didn't read the article asking someone who did read the article what the article says. In uh, <laughs> NVIDIA's blog post about it, they're saying they will make the AI tribute of the game available later this year on AI Playground. So it does sound playable. Yeah, I, I read the art blog post. I didn't read the paper, so uh, yeah. there you yeah, go. I, I guess, fully I guess, fully I, functional I, version of the classic. Yeah, I think, a... I think I solved my own question where it's like, well, obviously what you do is you allow the AI to also watch the inputs and outputs uh, for, that go into it. Uh, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. That's remarkable. Uh, uh, wonderful and scary. Yep, it was fed. It was fed visual data, the game in action, along with accompanying controller inputs. Okay, all right, yeah. Now that makes a uh, perfect yep. sense. Yeah. So, so it's able to to grok the fact that uh, uh, controller goes left, Pac-Man goes left. Yeah, I get it. I get yep. it. I could do this. Uh, man. When it. Oh yeah. Here we go. So there's another paper out, and I got. I try to find this where one of these other learning systems has been able to learn how to play just about, you know, all the basic, all your 80s classics, it can now beat our asses at. And just by watching, not by being given, fetting the, for the source code, controller inputs, looking at the screen and figuring out how to optimize to get the higher score in even more complicated games. And the ramifications is you, as it starts to do progressively more sophisticated games, then you get to play that game we called Life, yeah. Well, and, and we, we, we touched a bit on this last week on one of the Night Attack happy hours where uh, I think we were talking about how TikTok is a, a weird platform because it watches you watch it and then it doesn't, it doesn't ask you for your input on what you want to watch. It just sort of like, we get it. We're watching you watch this stuff. And, and uh, not that I'm a fan of it at all, but I can't, it, it seems like such an obvious thing that has to happen sooner or later. How long until... We have a social network where part of the the check yes to agree package includes also we're going to watch your eyes for eye dilation. We're going to uh, keep track of visually your pulse rate. We're going to gauge your imp, 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 uh, your interest via micro expressions. And we're just going to feed you whatever, you know, will keep you very interested. And um, seems like uh, if an AI can recreate Pac-Man from scratch just by watching it, it could certainly figure out what things to show a human to keep them interested and keep them watching. Brian, I don't subscribe to your conspiracy theory Orwellian story. Let me move on to the next one, which is Facebook. Facebook just announced that Oculus has sold $100 million worth of games <laughs> and, is, and, is, and, and, and maybe coming out with a new uh, Oculus Quest headset at the end of the year. Uh, and let, by the way, let, they've been working on eye tracking and putting cameras yeah, inside say, there to watch me, your face. Let me guess, there's a feature of the new Oculus Quest, a, a fourth and fifth uh, camera that are pointed inward? <laughs> to, no, to... actually, they've been testing that. Wow. Yes, because they want to be able to, to they want to do be able to do your facial reactions. So they put the camera on your face inside there and then they create an avatar that matches it. That's all. That's the only reason why they want to do that. That's it. Yeah. So what yeah. happens when an AI, man, this is a fun play space that I don't think we've been here in weird things in a while. What happens when an AI is given only one job? Show stuff that gets someone's heart racing and keeps them watching. So it's like uh, the first obvious thing is, you know, some kind of pornography or whatever. Um, or, or, but then I think about emotional constructs where it's like feed into it the fact that it figures out very quickly. Maybe it flashes a bunch of cartoons uh, and, and figures out from your eye dilations which ones you recognize and don't. Like, like it shows the old 1980s Dungeons and Dragons season eye dilation instantly pegs you as a Gen Xer from whatever, and then starts feeding you related other stuff looking for reactions, uh, then starts to, to show you transgressive images to see what horrifies you and what makes you scared, you know, skin galvanization, uh, heart starts racing, and, uh, but at some point, uh, figure, and then just starts showing you random faces until it happens upon one that looks exactly like uh, your best friend from whatever grade or your aunt or whatever. And then, and, 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 and without, you can't hide your physiological reactions from it. Then it starts to zero in. Uh, and then it also, maybe it consults your, uh, your 90,000 tweet backstory where you've been posting on Twitter, not realizing you've been keeping a public diary and it sort of gets your number on what, type of person you are what you're most afraid of and then it just starts telling a story involving characters you know and uh maybe it models it after the the hero's journey or something uh, all algorithmically all produced on the spot all designed to keep you 
God, I just horrified myself. You I know Facebook does that. Ghost story. You know Facebook does that, right? I, uh, y- yes, but they do those but, Facebook memories of here's your relationship with your best friend from elementary. Like they do do that. I mean, yes, it's not the big Homer's Odyssey that you're describing, but it is the more consumer friendly thing. I guess you're is, right. Here I, are the I'm photos really, of you and your friend from. I'm really here. just describing a slightly higher fidelity version of it, similar to um, uh, in the movie uh, 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 Minority Report. Really, he's just watching a slideshow of his kids. You know, he's watching home movies, but it's transformed by the fact that he's taking a drug that makes them seem like he's actually there. So there, there is. Uh, I guess. I guess really, they're already doing it. Uh, we already live in a hellscape. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's well, dumb and terrible. <laughs> well, it, and it and it all depends upon to what end it's done for. So like, I don't, I don't like those Facebook things and Apple does it too. Like, Oh, here's your year in review. I'm like, F you. Like, like I don't need some algorithm thing trying to pull my emotional strings. I'm sorry. I just, that's one of the things that actually turned me off from Facebook. Cause one, I saw some people like, Oh my God, I'm going to post this, my amazing year. And like, you did Jack, nothing. You did nothing this year. You have nothing to be proud of. You should be ashamed of yourself. Why are you sharing this with everybody? Uh, you, you know, it's funny, with this platform. Everything that you described is exactly how I feel in the first frame of any time Apple ever shows me any of that. And it's always the second frame where I go, yeah, but that was a pretty cool moment. Hanging out with Manatees never, with Justin. Never, that was great. <laughs> I never I never put the needle into my vein. Never put the needle into my vein. Mine, mine are oh. always messed up because I use my phone for like utility stuff, like to take time codes and stuff. So I get a lot of like, oh, man, remember a minute 23? Yes. Oh, oh. Same thing. Mine's like, mine's like 18 the, minutes and 16 seconds. Oh my God. Do you remember where were you when you got one megabit upload uh, yes. <laughs> on this day? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I certainly, I think that it's like anything you have the power to do things like you can make the wizard of Oz or you can make triumph of the will. Yeah. Both amazing, well accomplished, incredibly produced films. <laughs> Completely endorsed by Andrew <laughs> May. Just yeah, one, 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 one I've seen all the way through. The other one was a musical. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but that is it. That is the power of storytelling. And I'm I'm excited about and terrified that you know we 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 have Film, there is a world in which film or TV didn't exist and we ended up with something else. And I don't know what that is or completely different kinds of narratives or something. And, but with AI, like Brian, when you were describing like how to hit those responses, like, yeah, there could be, there could be forms of storytelling and stuff that we just, you think about a dream and how you get to the end of a dream, like, oh, that's a great dream. Then you explain it like, wait, that made no sense because your brain, the part of your brain that says this makes no sense is asleep. Right. Um, and I could see that, like, we could end up with just things of storytelling that just seem completely bizarre but make sense. And with these neural networks and the way they're able to train and learn and try to solve for trying to do a thing, it, it might be a thing where I watch – there's a film for Brian, which is this, you know, 75-second thing of a bunch of photos and music and stuff, and you're in tears at the end of it. And I'm like, he's a crazy person. I'm like, well, Andrew, watch yours. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, uh, that's interesting, too, because I didn't think about uh, from a magic trick perspective. Uh, we've already seen with some VR stuff, like it taking advantage of the fact that uh, uh, we need to simulate people being in a bigger space than they physically are by having you, when you turn, it over rotates or whatever or mm-hmm. under rotates. So essentially you're walking back and forth, but it doesn't feel that way that we know about cognitive uh, black holes like that. That, that when it comes to storytelling, like, for example, um, uh, we watched uh, all of Firefly, uh, uh, the, the whole series with my 16-year-old, and then we watched Serenity. And uh, the opening scene of Serenity, somehow having seen both multiple times, the opening scene of Serenity invalidates an entire character's behavior for the entire run of the show. The entire show, he's like, I'm mystified by this behavior that I'm seeing. I don't understand. But the opening scene of the pr- thing that happened before has him showing complete understanding of what the situation is. Um, that was a cognitive black hole that I walked past six, seven times and that my daughter caught instantly. So it'd be interesting if once you introduce AI, if it knows what you're, what somebody's you know, patterns of, of, of tending to miss certain things are, then all of a sudden you can do full-on dream logic that to one person 
would totally track, but to anybody else would look insane. Well, I'll, I'll give you uh, an area that I'm thinking that thin, I think a lot about is the idea of like, wh what is my role as a creator? So let's say we get to the point where, um, you know, I assume, you know, Amazon's my publisher and I love them. They've been great, but also Amazon's one of the biggest companies in the world and they work on AI. At some point they're going to have, we've talked about before the virtual Andrew. This is the thing that could write Andrew main books. What if my role at some point is, okay, I produce books and I have a story I want to tell. There is a Brian version. There is a Justin version. There is a Bryce version. It's essentially the same story, but you guys are going to experience it in a way that's more suited towards you. You're oh. going to get. So, so, okay. You know, so, so, so I, I would imagine it starts off as um, existing novels. Like let, let's take all of your existing novels and there's a new algorithm that says, Hey, we got this thing. We now have 10 years, uh, 15 years of psychological profiling on, on Brian, Justin, and, and Bryce. We suspect that your ratings will be a full star higher in general if you allow us to punch this button. And uh, it, it will essentially make your book 20% more relevant by customizing insignificant key details to make references that we know you made these references because they were, you thought they were universal, these will become more specific references that will resonate with these individual users. Do you want to do it and, and, and allow a customized version of your book? It's like, as an author, why wouldn't you, right? But well, then I'll, I'll, where does that go after that? Well, I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. I have a book coming out, I won't say which one, and I wrote a scene in there. It's called my, my... The Dad of a 7-Year-Old, a 12-Year-Old, and a 16-Year-Old <laughs> who used to be a magician and now does yeah. a lot of podcasting. The book by Andrew Main. <laughs> well, I, well, I have a scene in there that is a uh, – my agent called me up to say this is terrifying. She's like, this is genuinely terrifying. I'm like, yeah, cool. And, and then my publisher said, hey, this is terrifying. Your audience is going to be terrified we need to fix this. You know, we need to work our way around it. And I'm like, oh, and I'm like, you know, like she's right. Cause I know who my audience is. I know my age group. I know my demographic. And I also know some people, I, if you look at my, most of the one star reviews I get are for people who are upset that I used F bombs. Right? right. So if you told me, okay, do you want to sell out? I'm like, sure. I'll sell out. What do I have to do? Just tell me where to sign. I'm like, okay, sign this. And then what we'll do that person that hates the F bombs, the version of the book they get, there aren't going to be F bombs. The people who are going to be terrified about this scene, we're going to use an AI, AI to rewrite it. It'll be the same information we'll get across. It won't change the story, but we're going to tone it down. Not, you know, for Justin and Brian, I'm going to actually make it even more terrifying because I want them crying. Okay. For anybody else, we'll tone it down. And to me, that's, it's dangerous. It's very dangerous as an artist because as an artist, you say, how much do I want to cater to it? But putting that argument aside, yeah, that is one of the things I think that there could be is the idea of, okay, algorithmically, Help me make this book for this person and for this person and this person. And in a month or two, we can talk about some more examples of stuff like that, yeah. you know, of like the power yeah. of what we can do now. You, you know, what's funny is, is I, now I get to feel like Bryce because I get to say we've already been doing that because we've seen the USA and TBS versions of the Big Lebowski where the question being shouted is, this is what happens when you find a stranger in the Alps. Uh, this, uh, you know, uh, yeah. would you like a beer? John Fogarty would, you know, um, uh, so, so to some degree, we already kind of have oh. these various edited for content, uh, oh, you yeah. know, airplane yeah. versions but, of stuff. But, but, but imagine the, the, if you take that idea and now a automate it in a way that, you know, when you, when you watch a feature film on USA, you know, it's going to be different than it would be in a, in a theater. Now it's the, it's the exact same thing at, at the exact same place but you've got these inflection points that can be dialed up or down. It's fascinating. I don't know whether it damages our collective discussion of art because art in and of itself is so hard to pin down that like the way I experienced a movie and the way that everybody else did is always going to be different. Uh, or if it makes it a richer conversation to, to understand where our differences are and how we got there. Well, I think that, and I think there might be categories. For instance, like if I was going to write horror, then I'd be like, hey, I'm going to write a straight up horror novel. This is the way it is. But if I said, okay, I'm going to write, you know, sort of more, you know, mainstream commercial where I'm going to filter certain things, or if I say, hey, I, I'm going to do 
my you know individually adjusted version of other stuff. And I think it, it will be you know artists will have to decide when do you want to do this or not. Like I don't imagine Stephen King ever doing this because I think Stephen King you know. But then again, Stephen King will let his stuff be adapted into TV and film versions where they will do those reductions. And so I say we we've already agreed to it in theory. It's just the conditions that we negotiate. And and almost certainly up until now, um, maybe maybe some people have been thinking about it, but in general, you've been able to tell yourself as the author that it's like, hey man, I'm making my work. What happens after this is, you know, that's just the world happening around me. But it's like we're gonna enter where it's like before you even begin a project, you're gonna have to determine like what am I hoping the people at home to feel and how much how much uh, uh, emotional steroids am I willing to accept algorithmically to to get us to emotion well, A, B, and, or C? And and beyond that, this this creates widespread adoption. If those enhanced versions sell more, if your career can now, I mean, if if you can write something that is at least baseline structurally sound, and then this algorithm can take it to another level. I mean, why not? Is like it, I, I, I could see even big mainstream authors being pressured it, into doing it. Here's a, uh, again, I'm back to another Bryce moment. I think to some degree we already live in that world, only it's highly in inefficient and very expensive. And it's called the Disney corporation where they brutally, no one auteur is allowed to, completely own a project from beginning to end. Instead, everything is subjected to a brutal series of test viewings and feedback, figuring out how to plus everything, figuring out how to hit all four quadrants and all that stuff. And in general, they create very, very good stuff. But I'm, I'm with you, Justin. Like, what does it change if that's affordable and you get 80% of all that benefit from, uh, from an algorithm? No, and it's yeah. you know, and you 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 illustrated an example too, where you know they're going to put a hundred million dollars on the line. Of course, they're not going to let one person have their way, right. and and it's you know, and it's problematic in some regards. And that's one of the things I, I watch. Sort of artists go, ah, oh, I get frustrated with this interference. It's like they invested in a thing; they want to get their money back, and they may make their goal is to get the money back, not not to yeah. see your artistic vision realized. You're not getting a grant from the National Endowment of the Arts. You know, you're. You're, you're building a business. And if you choose to do that business, you got to recognize what that business is and choose your partners carefully. But um, it is, and this is going to happen faster than we think. It's going to happen faster than we I think. I mean, some some might su suggest that it's already happening. We're just waiting for it to be more public that uh, that this stuff is, is, is available and out there. Well, you look at like press releases, what happens like, you know, there's the stuff we see publicly, like the NVIDIA thing doing this and, and then the things learning it. And then, you know, who knows what goes on behind the scenes. And and also, like, uh, there, there was press release, too, like fifth most powerful supercomputer in the world now. Open that publicly and they have to say publicly because who knows what the Pentagon, what China has act, open AI, right. open AI and Microsoft made a deal. Microsoft built them the supercomputing cluster. And so now you've got like the fifth most powerful computer in the world or the top five computer is building neural networks and stuff. And Damn. we're gonna get more of this stuff and the outcomes from this are just exciting and terrifying and fascinating. It is so funny yeah. how quickly uh, fear turns to optimism. Like uh, you could say that and I can instantly get scared. And then the next thing I could say could be like, and it's focused on solving coronavirus. And then suddenly yeah. I love it <laughs> just like that. Yeah. yeah. And making it more lethal. <laughs> oh, duh. <No! laughs> <laughs> but cheaper to get away from in space. <laughs> well, that's why you've got, there's a number of organizations now, like, because we, we mentioned, we've talked about OpenAI, which is looking for the benevolent, you know, how to find, you know, benevolent use of AI and kind of prevent sort of Skynet. There are other organizations too. There's partnerships now. And they're trying to find these ways to sort of like, okay, we've got these powerful things. How do we decide what's too dangerous, what's not? Let's let, let's let our peers look at this stuff and see what we're doing and compare. And, you know, it's, there was a actually another open AI reference. There was a paper that came out a couple of weeks ago, which, and we talked about this before at how their ex algorithms, AI algorithms are accelerating faster than Moore's law, meaning that they're getting more efficient towards the amount of space they use, the amount of processing power. 
which means that they're just getting, we're getting more and more efficient at these things. And that means that that, that rate of acceleration to the point at which things happen. There's companies right now that do code completion. Like if you're writing computer code, it'll suggest how to complete your code. Now they're going to get to the point where it'll probably look at what kind of program you're, oh, you want a for loop here, don't you? Okay, let's put the for loop in there too. And it's like, oh, I got a better image optimizer for you. And it just... So I, we're already starting to see kind of the nibbles on it where uh, like in Gmail, when you're writing, they have a new feature, a relatively new feature, where when it sees you obviously mistype a word, it doesn't even ask you. It just corrects the spelling of it and then just, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it does underline it so that you can go back and fix it if you want. Um, it also has very rudimentary one-line replies that you tend to use built out of your own words or whatever. But it's like... Um, like, uh, I, 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 that, that middle step of like fan letter says a whole bunch of things and you're like, and it's like, uh, there have been enough exchanges with fan letters that I am certain, uh, some algorithm could say, Hey man, I got this. Look, uh, you start by thanking them. You start to, uh, uh, t uh connect with their letter to uh, talk about, uh, uh, what, what it means to you that they said this thing about it. You mention a story about why that was hard and now you feel good that you made the right decision. Then you thank them and you encourage them to watch your next thing and you ask them if there's anything you could do for them. I got this, uh, let, me, let, me, let me do this. Which again, back to uh, my internal Bryce is now saying, we've had that, they're called personal assistants. <laughs> but, but again, what happens when it's a, a robot that, that does so it at scale? So this is this is how I imagine sort of the, the your your inf your news feed information feed of the not too distant future is you'll get a no notification boom you thanked so and so for sending you a nice fan mail yep you're like cool did you want to follow and you're like oh follow up and say and like and and I think we got to get used to the it the idea too because here's the thing I think about virtual assistants we'll get used to them and know the idea that a good virtual assistant will be like hey if this is important I will flag it to the man upstairs. But I'm also gonna let the man know you got it, okay? And if the man wants to respond or whatever, they can respond or whatever. But they know, they know that this happened. And if you get used to the idea of like, I'm like, oh yeah, I want, you know, I want to talk to Brian Thursday. Hey Brian, I want to talk Friday, you know, Thursday. And I get Brian's virtual assistant says, uh, Brian will try to fit it in. Good enough for me, you well, know. And, and what's, then what's really wild is there could be a time where Brian and Andrew will meet each other for the very first time and have a first exchange of any words. Uh, and it will be because both of our virtual assistants say, um, you have a meeting at 2 p.m. with Andrew Main. I'm like, great, who's that? And it's like, you've been talking with him off and on for four years. You, uh, He complimented your project, you thanked him, you complimented his project. These are the things you said to, to each other. Here's what you, uh, what, what, quote unquote, you know about him and, and what he likes, uh, enjoy the conversation. And I, and I don't know that that will in any way harm that connection we have in that moment. If, if I, if I trust the algorithms that brought us together and I trust the track record of us consistently saying like, no, 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 keep us in touch. Keep us, it, it, that, that kind of happened, um, just a couple of days ago. Cause I saw you and Matt Ridley chatting on Twitter and I, you know, just butted in saying, you guys should collaborate with what I was really saying is I'm a fan of both of you. Right. And then Matt Ridley said, then retweet my book. <laughs> and I was like, I'm very flattered that that matters to you here. I retweeted your book. It's great. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, 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 I don't know. I, I, I don't think it makes anything less real. It does make it, it feels weird though, to think about. Oh, well you, yeah. And you, I think part of it is the idea of when you think about the, the way I think that I'd be comfortable with uploading myself, my consciousness upload, would not to be uploaded all at once to be doing it gradual. Half of my processes are taking place online, half of them in the flesh, and over and over I just switch more to one side than the other. And so it's not like one day I wake up and it's just the virtual me. It's no, I mean, the meanness got spread. And I could see a thing where it'd be like, I could have like my avatar could tell me, oh yeah, Brian, you, you know, we, you met Brian, virtual me and virtual Brian talked at a convention. You both have this in common. This is pretty cool. He recommended this book and I'm going to put it in your audible list, you know, and it could be like, I would maybe be aware of you, but never talk directly to you, but a virtual assistant be like, I'm like, oh, this is a really cool YouTube video. Yeah. Virtual Brian suggested. Oh, that's great. Tell him. Thank you. And then finally we meet like, dude, your books and stuff. It's great. It's great to see you in person. Um, I thought you were a chick. Uh, yeah, well, and, and, and to <laughs> s some extent that happened to me because I was insulted when uh, when I first started working at Revision 3 doing Scam School, um, uh, we play, I played Rock Band 
uh, with with Ron Richards, and and we we melted faces on three songs, and then he turned and introduced himself to me, and I'm like, he goes, I'm Ron Richards. He goes, I hey, I'm Ron. I'm like, yeah, I know we we don't we've known each other, and he's like, no, we've never met before, and in that horrifying moment, I realized. Nope, I've been watching his show iFanboy for uh, for almost a year now, and that's why I thought we were already friends. I talked to you on the YouTube. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. right? <laughs> so what I did I mention this here, but the idea that imagine so I get done watching, let's say I watch the show Devs, and none of you guys have watched it. So I'm like, fine, give me virtual Justin and Brian, and I'm gonna get on the phone with them. Hey guys, I just watched Devs. You seen it? No, it's cool. Like this is cool. Oh, really? Like this? Da, da, da. Oh, okay, like that. Very, very cool. Da 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 da. Or, or that you guys have this sort of the virtual ones know they like. Oh yeah, I like this part. Da da. Justin finishes watching it. He's like, ah, I want to talk to Andrew about it. Oh, Andrew already talked to me about it. Well, let me just go talk to that that let, neural let, network. Let me listen to the podcast, uh, which because I, that's the other weird thing is conversations like to this, it? like listening to these conversations after the fact is so surreal because I forget the actual conversation, but instead I just hear past Brian and I'm like, oh man, right now I would bring up, and then sure enough, those are the words that come out of my but, mouth. But it could be, but it could be instead of the podcast, it would be he will interact with that neural network. Hey, I just watched it virtually. Like, well, what did you think? Like, oh, I really dug this. Yeah, here's the thing I really dug. Da 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 back and forth. And neither one of us talking to each other in real time, but by the time we meet in person again, we're up to date on what everybody felt about it. Uh that'd be really interesting. The uh the sort of resolving where it's like the AIs come like, hey, I have a 30 second update. Uh, by the way, the version, the same, uh, the conversation you had didn't exactly track as well as we had hoped. Yeah. Turns out that, that Andrew had more beef with this and, and Justin was more interested in blah. Uh, just, you know, just to uh, do me a favor, correct your brain, pretend that's the conversation yeah. you had. Correct, correct the record. Well, yeah. Well, I have an idea. Like what we need is like, instead of the little at symbol is like the little V, like the virtual at Justin Robert Young, the virtual Brian Brushwood. And so that we know, like, oh, I'm talking to the virtual one or something like that, something like the avatar, or maybe that's at means avatar of you. So I will get the idea. Oh, it's not the canonical, but it's close enough. Maybe, uh, maybe there's a version, you know, we've talked about the idea on the productivity side on after, after things we've talked about office hours, like maybe there's, you know, uh, uh, office hours could be 24 hours, but, and it's pretty much what you would get. Like we've watched enough public access office hours of Brian Brushwood, Andrew Maine, Justin Robert Young, Bryce Casillo, that we could pretty much handle this for them. Uh, but if you happen to call during the actual office hours, or maybe we stop, maybe we stop even telling when the actual uh, ones are, and you don't really get to know when it's the, the real us or, or close enough us. It's weird. I, I think, I think, I think absolutely. I think it's going to get to a point where we're going to, when, Part of it is just the having the AI interact. The other part of it, the other part of it is going to be having the updating you and keeping you up to date on what the conversation was. And that'll be the next step is to figure out like, how do I get Brian up to date on the thousand interactions or how do I choose which ones will be relevant, likely to be relevant? What about, uh, man, I can even imagine a version of the world where after all this is established, um, when you go to sleep at night, you go to sleep and the first hour is before you start naturally dreaming and everything is just some mojo that does memory correction where it's just like, Hey, we're just syncing you up with how everything quote unquote really went in the virtual conversations or, or what the official record is of, of how things went. Well, uh, which yeah, again, I mean, I think the, the, the Bryce the larger... in my mind says, we already live in that world. Everybody is reading separate news feeds and living in different realities now. It doesn't need to be me every time. <laughs> no, I, I, I love that it's you. <laughs> well, I mean, I think the, the, the larger question is where in society do we accept our virtual selves? Like, are, are those just like digital ghosts that we assume are going to get you factual information and have enough of an idea of our opinions that they would be able to generate them like and and how do we accept that do we accept that on a friends and family level like is there a brand awareness thing like this way you can have the most interactive uh uh twitter right while also never stepping out of bounds because programmatically you can just say never go into these places oh that's interesting so 
Twitter's a good example because because the fire hose exists and everybody's tweets are all in public, you could create bots to represent, let's say theoretically, every single person on Twitter. So you could spawn a copy of all of Twitter, say whatever you want, treat it as your chat room, and whatever dog whistles you say for good things or bad things will be responded to by virtual versions of people who would respond to it in real life. So you, you, you can almost enter a holodeck simulated real time reality with no consequences. Well, well I, I was thinking more along the lines of you just, your Twitter is, is just for all the at replies at the very least, maybe you you type out the new posts, but for all the at replies, anybody wants to ask you, you can set guardrails on like, whenever somebody brings up politics, uh, uh, you know, have these like a, a, a diffusing with a language <laughs> yeah or i mean like, like either that like or uh, uh you just know that the ai knows all right mm -hmm. here's when somebody brings something up these are the ways that you can give them something that they feel is substantive and yet it diffuses the argument like well, I, or I, I, go ahead yeah i think yeah, I think that would be I think that would be super valuable. And that might be a thing that Twitter made itself try to do is because like, I get people like, oh, what book comes out? There's so many these questions could be answered right now with an existing chatbot. Yeah. But the other thing is like most people have already accepted the virtual sort of things because like, oh, I love so and so, this politician or this famous person on Twitter. I'm like, there's two people who do that. That person almost never tweets. And you're accepting that's the person. Yes. You know, and 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 you know, it's like, oh, I don't like this person because they misspell. Like, well, that's actually that person tweeting, you know, <laughs> and then the other person you like, it's fake. That's not them. But you don't want to know. You don't care to know. You just want to know that this person means them and their assistants and whoever their manager, whoever's responding for them. Because I'll go like, you know, I'll look at like some of these older celebrities and I'm like, I think he wrote this. This is an assistant. This is an assistant. This is an assistant. I think he wrote this. This is an assistant and sort of thing. And I tend not to follow those people because like, uh, I don't know. Man, what's funny is I, I can't help but put names to it. I'm like, yeah, uh, Betty White and George Takei are brands. Pretty sure Ed Begley Jr. is writing all of his actual tweets. And, and yeah. Greg Grunberg is definitely actually Greg Grunberg. And uh, it, it, yeah. Yeah. And I, any politician, just about any politician, you know that somebody else has their Twitter account. And I mean, is, uh, you know, that that oh, is one like of the 100%. Uh, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, certainly, I think the president is doing his tweets. I think Justin Amash I would say was doing he's his the tweets. Exception. <laughs> yeah. well, who's, who was the other one? Uh, Justin Amash. I think that that's one of the things I liked is that he is like you. You could see how widely things swung. That made me think yeah. like like that it was all really him. Well, yeah, no, uh, I think, I'm sure the president was doing his, but I I think that was well, yeah. the exception, not the rule. Yeah, and also it took him a while to do it, but he but he used to do, and uh, he had for a while, even through the campaign, was that he would dictate something to somebody they would write it out and print it out he would look at it on paper and then it would go <laughs> on to twitter um i think he has certainly gotten more uh, uh dialed in to it as as uh, he realized the power of it uh but yeah in general though like yeah the the people that have big twitter followings in politics generally have teams to help them do it yeah, I, I, uh, Dr. Chiron said I gave up on Twitter a couple years ago due to toxicity, and I totally understand. Let me give you a piece of advice which you can think about doing. You just create a list. Create a list of people you want to follow. Not all my friends are in that list because some of my friends get very political, and I don't want to respond to this. Or they say things, and I'm like, I, I don't. I know they're also, angry and they're saying I, this. If if I can add on to that, make sure it's a private list because your friend of mine, Andrew Heaton, accidentally uh, didn't know that he had a public Ooh. list. He made a list of titled "People I Need to Unfollow," <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, all of these like governors are DMing him, saying like, "What's going on, bro?" <laughs> so he ended up like negging half of Hollywood and then becoming good friends with them as a result of apologizing. Yeah, that was uh, that was one of those social media manager things that like he was trying to utilize and didn't realize that he'd made a public list to like uh, insult like the most insultable people on Twitter. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. So make a private list. <laughs> private. Private. Make a private list, and you can have a wonderful, interesting sort of experience on Twitter. Because there are some people I know who are pretty positive. They know they're not going to shove their politics in my face and whatever. Because it's like it's not like I'm going to Twitter. I need to ho- hear more political opinions. Hmm. You know. I want to hear what everybody else is upset about because I have none of my own. You know? uh, yeah, thing that was rarely spoken aloud. I'm undecided. Let's check Twitter. <laughs> yeah. So you can you can have a very very cool like yeah raw raw Twitter even with people I like and I have conversation with in person is not fun because a lot of a lot of people they treat it like a garbage disposal. Yeah. You know, like ah, I'm angry. I just throw this into the Twitter and it's like and I'm like ah, oh, what's coming at me here? <laughs> So. Uh, hey man, uh, I, I, I got a pick that, um, uh, I suspect will take too much time to talk about in, in as the depth that I would love, but, um, uh, I finally watched all of devs and, uh, my goodness, mm. did I like devs a lot. Um, uh, I, I know Bryce you has should talk to Bryce. Uh, well, and, and talk I, to I, Bryce about I, that. And, Bryce and, and hates indeed, devs. indeed we will <laughs> on today's spoiler in time. I'm actually really looking forward to hearing uh what his experience was but uh, uh andrew ha- have you already seen burning it? burning <laughs> hatred is his experience he thought it was a hundred percent crap have i have i seen it when i was knocking on all of your doors with my watchtower magazine telling you guys that you heard <laughs> no, you know it, about it, devs sorry it was lost in the noise of all the other ringing doorbells of everyone else asking if i'd heard the good word but i finally i finally watched it man huh. my goodness um Looking back on it, uh, I I can't find virtually any wasted space. Uh, there there are moments that things are left I on the can. table. Holy crap! I, I I can't wait to to oh, argue about it. It's, there it's, we go. I'm really Hater excited. Hater Bryce. Damn it, you Hater got Bryce. No, it's, it's, it's gonna be great. It. It's gonna be a great conversation. I loved it. I loved it so much. Um. Uh. uh I I finished it. I maintained my composure long enough to get downstairs, open the door, look my wife in the eye, and then laid in her lap and just ugly cried for five minutes straight. It was it was an extraordinary experience for me. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. I mean, it was very powerful. <laughs> I, I love devs because I love Alex Garland. Alex Garland is a guy that he is going to explore a topic. I may not agree with his conclusions. Or I may not agree with his philosophical point of view, but I will know that he did his homework, that he thought it through intelligently, and he's going to make me look at it from a different point of view. And well, I, 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 yeah, loved and, it. And to, to, to me, one of the extraordinary things about, I, I think for all of his work, uh, I, we've got some friends who didn't like Annihilation. I liked Annihilation. But it's a tough a thing. It's a tough thing to have dual tasks where it's like you want to convey interesting ideas and conversations, uh, make them accurate or at least scientifically plausible, and then also, oh, by the way, could you also make it absolutely gorgeous from beginning to end? And and the only other example I could think of of really nailing it is Sam Esmail with Mr. Robot, where it's like that is accurate technical hacking from beginning to end with exquisite attention to detail, also visually gorgeous to look at from beginning to end. And uh, devs, it feels like the same thing for me. Yeah, I did not. I really wasn't. Annihilation wasn't for me, but also that was an adaptation. You know, and that was out Al- when it's Alex Garland being original. I, I'm a huge fan. His his stuff is amazing. So yeah, I, I think I love. I think it. with Annihilation, I got the concert experience because I think I'm the only person I know who saw it in theaters. Everyone else saw it at, at home. I saw it in theaters. Uh, oh, and you st- you you didn't like it. I like that movie. Oh, yeah, what? so both can, of us. Can I like? Okay, like, okay. Like, well, no, no, no. Like I, I, I'm trying to figure out yeah. how much of it was the cinematic experience because it did feel. It's a bit like watching Pink Floyd's The Wall, you know, where it's it's less about, you know, it's hard for me to even remember the story, but the but the visual images were very powerful to me, and I liked yeah. them a lot. Uh, uh, no, I, I, I saw it in the theater. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. I think it. Yeah, I saw, I, uh, it had Alex a Alex Garland fan here. Theater release. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Bryce saw devs in the toilet bowl because that's where poop belongs. <laughs> right before pressing flush. Yeah, that's a, how much so, Bryce hated devs. So on 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 the topic of devs, and advice to anybody else out there is that it is about it. It, it feels like it's going to be kind of a conventional thriller, and it becomes about more, and it keeps going, and the people. You, you understand the motivations of people much more deeply. And you may not agree at the end and go, okay, everybody's justified, but you go, oh, from what the way they looked at the world, I understand, you know, and that's what I loved about it. And then how he addressed this, you know, I don't, I, I've told friends like I, it's, 
you know, where X Machina was about artificial intelligence. Devs is about blank and blank. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. It's, I think the ending of devs is great. I think it's fantastic. I like that they tried to touch on, on these topics that are, you know, not really touched on in mainstream or big budget shows like this. Uh, I, I think it, it handles uh, having a pretty limited cast and, and uh, 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 environments really well. It, it looks gorgeous. I mean, the, the the entire um the well, the air gapped the whole machine just the everything with the machine like looks really gorgeous um it's also maybe a couple episodes long but i think uh i think devs is is very good the let biggest out, poop Bryce. he's ever taken let <laughs> it out, Bryce. More like dumps. let him know the truth <laughs> let him know the truth i i and i tell you when i recommend it and, and to bryce point when i recommend Hashtag it to people bryce hates devs <laughs> when i recommend it to people i give a lot of qualifiers because mm-hmm. like i just told i was telling uh mary our friend mary jarris is telling her i was like like here check out devs part of the dialogue is like david mammon-esque and alex garland wrote and directed everything but he's a future film guy so he's doing eight episodes so bear in mind this but i think he's so brilliant that i will i I would you know i'll bear through anything for him because i think he's just such a talented you know guy and he's just there are so few people i think working in sci-fi that i think are really smart and get it there are some people that kind of get it but it feels like they're at some malibu party and smoke some pot and listen to a professor from ucla and they're like oh yeah or caltech like oh yeah i'm gonna make a show about this and that's it and then you're like you want it to be smarter i'm not gonna name any particular shows you're like no this is all there is they they did not they don't know there's a there there. Yeah. Uh, devs. It's on Hulu. It's a Hulu. It's if people. Hulu, it's, it's a Hulu on. It's FX on Hulu. So it's a kind of a half Hulu original. Well, yeah, because yeah, FX gave up their whole streaming platform to go exclusively to Hulu. So yeah, Justin, you got a pick? Uh, yeah, just wrapped up the Viceland series, Dark Side of the Ring. Uh, they just ended their second season. Apparently, the. Uh, Finale was the most watched thing on Viceland, which, I mean, not exactly the highest hurdle to clear, but certainly cheers to them for doing it. Uh, The final episode told the story of uh, the final days of the wrestler Bret Hart. All of them are wrestling related, as you might uh, guess, but they are. I don't know if since the movie. um, Oh, gosh, darn it. Beyond the mat, there has been any like well-polished uh non-affiliated with a promotion look into the history of wrestling and some of the issues that were tackled in season two including a two-parter at the beginning of the season about the uh chris benoit murder suicide and then the death of owen hart which was a tragedy that happened during a live pay-per-view um and included uh interviews with uh owen's surviving widow who sued the wwf and his kids are uh well worth watching human stories that i think even a non-wrestling fan would appreciate uh and i've only watched one episode of the series but i liked it very very much uh uh, the format is uh I, i i don't know what i was expecting but i was very impressed with the depth of of uh, how easy it was to get the full story even if you don't consider yourself deep into wrestling culture yeah it's um a very visually stylized show that uses not only kind of a retro 80s soundtrack uh almost evocative of like uh unsolved mysteries or something but also a really really stylized version of uh reenactments that i think are really visually compelling and add a lot to the <laughs> without final overdoing it i'm looking at you mcmillions <laughs> yeah uh but yeah it, it they do a lot of just like great body doubles but everything's backlit so you can't see the faces but you just get these like really well done uh, uh senses but there was a lot of stories wrestling stories that i had no idea of that uh some of them are fun but uh obviously it's dark side of the ring so Eventually, you know, the, the the piper has to get paid, and it's usually in uh, tragedy. Cool. Uh, I got a pick. Uh, this, Is it devs? It's, it's not devs. Not that I hate it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hashtag Bryce hates devs. <laughs> uh, there's a, a new season of a show out on Amazon Prime for an Amazon Prime original 
called uh, Homecoming. Homecoming Season 2 is out. Uh, I finished it up over the weekend. It's got uh, Janelle Monet and um, uh, uh, Hong Chow, I believe, who gets bumped up to pr- a, a, a pretty primary role in this season. Um, Sam Esmail is not a part of the show this season. Oh. And you can tell. Um, that's not the that's not season two's biggest crime. Season two big, biggest crime is that it has one mystery, and it and once you understand it, it really just wants to hammer home. We have to get from point B to point A. Um, but uh, I I think I think it's fine. It's a fine little uh, mystery. It it's a lot like season one, which is like what's going on, who are these people, what are the machinations of this uh, kind of. Um, dark scary corporation what are they doing what are their motivations um and uh, i i don't it doesn't have the same impact as season one um it takes place in the same world and a lot of the same characters are still there um but i think the stakes are really really low uh in terms of the 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 uh, you know what lives are at stake and what the ramifications are for the planet uh, I think I think the stakes are re- are really low, and by the end of it, you're like, okay. Uh, that said, it's seven half hour episodes. It's not even eight like the first one was. So, or no, ten. Well, I think the first. I one thought was. I thought putting in the office coffee maker really was a good idea. You know, I, I think that in the end, you know, not having to go out to Starbucks was kind of an important dis- decision for the show's you know <laughs> narrative price. So, it's it's, oh, it's do, do do they wedge a bunch of. Amazon products into it or what? No, what's I have happening? no idea what he's talking <laughs> oh, okay. about. I, I just heard low stakes. I, I don't, I don't, I, I, and I don't want to spoil it because there's not a lot of it. In fact, there, I would say there are probably two main mysteries this season, which is who is Janelle Monet's character? Cause the whole thing is she wakes up in a boat with amnesia and what is going on with the company. And you find out what happens with Janelle, Janelle Monet in episode two, which is pretty good because the Amazon X-ray also spoils it uh, just immediately. If you pause the show, it will say, oh, yeah, here's who she is. Uh, <laughs> it's a, it's sorry it's a, about it. It's a bit like Jesus when, when spoiler, spoiler alert, it was a bit like when Bryce said, uh, oh, yeah. Oh. And uh, <laughs> well, what's it? Jason Bateman's Jason. in the first couple of episodes of this HBO series. <laughs> okay. And then episode one is like... <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. So, so yes, okay. So it is a lot like that. Um, and then once that's revealed, like there's, like I'm glad it's only seven episodes instead of ten last season because I think really it only justifies maybe five episodes. Uh, but I think the performances are really good. Janelle Monae is great. Hong Chao like really blossoms into being a kind of multi-dimensional character instead of just being like this strange office administrative assistant um uh so uh, yeah and then uh, uh you know some some recur some cameos from from people from last season but uh homecoming as, as somebody who thought i hated homecoming while i was watching it and then the second it was over instantly thought that was fun that was cute i'm glad i watched that um yeah. uh, recommend or do not recommend season two it's funny because I had a I pre- I feel like I had the opposite of, uh, feeling of it, which is like I was as I was watching it, I thought, okay, this is fine. We're building a mystery, intention, and stuff. And then by the end of it, I was like, I don't that that was very lukewarm. So I I think it's a very easy watch. Um, I don't think it's must watch TV. But yeah. if you like season one of Homecoming, I think it's it's worth th- trying a couple episodes. Try a couple episodes out. Um, and know that Sam Esmail is very much not in charge of this thing or not directing. <laughs> so, uh, Homecoming. Andrew? My pick is, I'm going to pick again because uh, it is an amazing book. I'm still in the process of reading, but it's just every page is wonderful. And I'm actually not going to pick how innovation works. I'm going to pick getting two copies of how innovation <laughs> works. Uh, you, you know what's funny? I don't know why I haven't dived into it. I think it's like I know I'm going to love it so much that I'm holding off like like a dessert. Um, I already have it in my Audible queue, uh, but but I'm so thrilled to hear like like uh, at this point you've been with it for a while. Is it? Would you say as good as the Rational Optimist? Is it better? Or? So I would say that in and I am. Uh, 
I'm very lucky that I had a friend that was very good friends with Matt Ridley, and through Matt, through that friend, I got to hang out with Matt and spend some vacation time with Matt and get to know him. And so, I just clarify like how I know him is because I have a buddy who was good friends of like, oh, you should hang out, whatever. And I got to see sort of behind the scenes of when he was working on the Rational Optimist, and the Rational Optimist was I know he wanted that to be kind of his sort of big argument for optimism and whatnot, looking how things get better and all that. And he kind of felt like it didn't quite do what he wanted it to do. You know, that, that, as far as that narrative, how, and that, that's my understanding was he felt like this was sort of what we wanted to be this very persuasive thing. And it didn't land the way that it did. Whereas I think this is a kind of a more persuasive thing of getting to the nuts and bolts of innovation mm -hmm. and showing why it works, why it flourishes under free societies, why when you have free exchange and you're able to trade and why these things, why you get more innovation, which sounds obvious, but then we have a lot of policies and things that are counter to that. And so I think that the examples he gets into are wonderful. And I think he just makes a very good case. And I think that you just walk away with just a lot more powerful storytelling to go through of, of examples of this. And so I'd say that's sort of the beauty of it is, is you walk away with all these examples to say like, oh, this happened because this, and that led to this. If we didn't have that, we never would have got there and sort of destroy some of the myths of, you know, like, well, I love NASA. And people will go like, well, NASA gave us this and this. I'm like, hey, I love Xerox Park. Xerox Park gave us this, 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 and this. I love, you know, you know, IBM's research labs, you know, gave us, you know, things like Unix and underlying things and stuff. And if you want to argue that putting money into a into an you know innovative organization is going to give you cool stuff, you are right. But if you want to argue what's the most efficient way to do that, I don't know that it is a government one. I don't know that it's not, but I know that I can show you all these examples of, and even you watch these research organizations of where uh, Lucent and other things eventually sort of fell because they became more about pure research and not market stuff, not stuff that was actually going to move the needle on stuff and whatnot. And, and he makes some very good points too about how like, we always think that sort of pure science drives engineering, but it was like the steam engines actually what how we started to understand thermodynamics because we're trying to figure out how to make better steam engines and we're trying to figure out why do they work and not work and where is the heat loss coming through and we're trying to explain these things and that drove a ton of thermodynamic research and it wasn't sort of the other way around where somebody you know you know Boyle was just like ah oh, I'm just gonna study the way these gases work and somebody's like ah oh, now I can use it to make an engine you know it's like nope kind of the other way around right. so uh, I think Brian I think you will love it absolutely absolutely love it cool. How innovation works. Boom. Gentlemen, it's been weird. Uh, so I'll, I, I think the iPad has charged enough. I'm going to swap these out for the tethering because it looks like some phone calls were okay. coming in that couldn't be answered. Uh, okay. So we'll see if that's able to work quickly. I'm going to let my air run for right now. All right. Uh, well, we've, we'll probably lose the Skype call here, so uh, mm -hmm. we'll probably get you back in just a moment. Just a moment. Hello, everybody. All right, we'll get ready for after things. We'll have to keep after things really brisk. Um, we we got and we 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 did get started a little later, which is is our fault. Um, but it's, oh, yep, and there goes. Oh, but Justin and Andrew, I guess, are still on the audio line, so. Yeah, no, I can still hear you. And actually, I can still see Andrew's face. Oh, I can excellent. see Justin's face. Oh, I can just see uh, Andrew in the middle of drinking water. So I'm going to take him off the screen. No, I'm still drinking it. I'm still drinking <laughs> it. Oh, he's not finished, you son of a bee. <laughs> uh, no, it's good to hear the opal on a dedicated line. Yeah. Definitely, uh, definitely a lot better than watching it collapse under the weight of bad internet yeah definitely uh all right let me see if i can get connected Maybe. <laughs> our, our friend brett ransomville retweeted apparently the way they're doing baptisms is priests with water pistols <laughs> oh yeah no there's like a whole a whole like a a, a compilation of that uh, so funny yeah it was uh, when when you were mentioning um, the the coffee maker thing. While I was talking about homecoming, Andrew, I think it threw and uh, th I think it threw Brian and I off for a loop because uh, we're watching Larry Sanders for 
spoiling time and one of the episodes that's a minor plot point where they buy a coffee machine so that one of the assistants doesn't have to go out for Starbucks and the coffee is too hot and it's not good and so they <laughs> go back to Starbucks. So I think we were we were a little a little thrown by that. I'm just a man of the times, you know, I just pick up the zeitgeist. <laughs> All right, let me see if we can get if we can get some, oh I might have to reset this reset the switch here too. Yeah, I'm gonna have to do that. Give me one sec. You got it. I'm gonna go take a restroom break. You got it. I'm gonna stay here. Oh hey everybody. Uh uh what's going on, friends? It's just two empty chairs and me, the disembodied voice of your friend, Justin Robert Young. I want to remind everybody that you can listen to Bryce Hate Devs uh, <laughs> every week on this show. No matter what, there's not going to be a guarantee that we're going to talk about ghosts or goblins or space or science or horror. But you, what you will know is that Bryce will lose a torrent of... Uh, pulsating, undulating hate to the Alex Garland show devs. Are you back now? No, we're still working on it. Uh, I'm. Yeah, you might need to do that because I'm. I'm not getting anything. Uh, I'm still Wait, seeing you what? broadcast. But the the encode and the Opal are on a different network. Why is he? He should not be going to do that. Hold on, give me one sec. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is Court Killers on today? Indeed it is. And Bryce is going to take a big old poop on Debs. That's what Bryce is going to do. He's all about it. And uh, uh, furthermore, um, Andrew's going to come back and we'll be able to talk and Bryce will be back and it'll be a good time. You know, I was talking to Bryce about the problem of what have, may have been the illegal bombing in North Korea, of, of Korea, excuse me, it's in Vietnam, across into like Cambodia and stuff to destroy the North Vietnamese you know, supply lines and the tragedy uh -huh. of how this was. And, and Bryce says, yes, but it wasn't as bad as devs. That's true. That's the thing that Bryce Castillo definitely said. He often yeah. compares atrocities, big and small, to how much he was disappointed by the Alex Garland FX series devs. You know, I was talking about some new cancer research and some new possible treatments, yep, and he's yep. like, well, I would rather have that than devs. Than devs. <laughs> devs, yeah. yeah. Oh, cancer wow. better than devs, according to Bryce. Yep, wow. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, how are you doing, Andrew? What's going on? I got my AC on, so that's good. Uh. And, uh is it hot? Yeah, is it's it hot, hot in California? Out here in California. Yeah, it, it well, LA is always a little hotter than the Bay Area, and I know out here it's been getting into the 70s and like just kissing the 80s uh in in Oakland. So uh you know, I, I can I can only imagine what it's like down there in LA. Mm. Yeah, uh, I know you guys. Yeah, you guys in Texas are just sweating bullets. Yeah, it's uh, it's starting to get that hun It's starting to get that '90s hundred season. Um, though we had we had we had some pretty bad storms uh last night. Uh, hail! I got hail, quarter size hail. They say. Yeah, damn. Was, yeah. was uh, the gang was the gang all there? <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, uh, uh, the the difference though is that uh, uh central air conditioning. Yes. Big, big, big cultural difference between California and many other places, or at least the LA and the Bay Area, which generally have very temperate climates. Um, but uh, but yeah, when it gets hot, boy, does it get hot. I thought it's New York. New York didn't have central air conditioning in in any apartment that I lived in either. You just were relying on the window units. And it, it's interesting because, like, New York's one of those things where you talk to certain people of New York, like, well, that's when we go to the Hamptons. And I'm like, everybody? Is, like, everybody <laughs> go to the Hamptons? No, no, not everybody. I, the, the hottest I've ever been when I was living, I was living in Jersey City, 
And it was so hot. We literally got, we went out to Coney Island. Yeah. Uh, just to be by the beach, but also because they were doing a, a screening of the Warriors, which was really great. <laughs> but That's also, a great it was like, movie to watch and then take public transportation back. <laughs> exactly. No, it was, it was actually awesome. It was when, um, uh, the draft house was doing their like rolling road show of, uh, of movies. So they were playing like clerks in like the parking lot across from the, uh, actual, uh, convenience store and the warriors out in Coney Island. And I think they did like field of dreams in like a, a big field in Iowa in summer. Like, uh, that was pretty rad. It was funny because at that point, I, I don't know if they really even had much of a footprint as a brand beyond uh, beyond like Texas. And I think they'd sold some um, licenses for stuff in like Virginia. So I have a, I don't know which were the Czech or the Polish version of one of my books. All I know is one of my fans put this photo up on Instagram of her holding the book. And that's like blood on her hands and stuff. Oh my God. <laughs> I liked it. I don't know what I'm liking, but, uh, yeah, I guess she's a fan. I have no idea. I have no idea. I, I don't understand. <laughs> All right. There we go. There's <laughs> All right. Um, so now we need to keep it even more brief. Yeah. He didn't get out. We got this. I can Sorry, not... text I'm putting there. I have no idea what's going on here, but I approve. <laughs> Join call. Join with video um, and audio. I, I want to add this for you guys just uh, as we go into after things, but uh, there is a level on the politics Patreon where <laughs> at $10, I will read your name at the end. Uh, and somebody has just uh, 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 pledged that amount oh. for uh, under the name "I pooped my pants," <laughs> and uh, the email they've used to set up their Patreon account is "You better read this on the podcast <laughs> at gmail dot com." That's amazing. <laughs> That check clears. Look, uh, we, we we had to deal with that with the uh, the giant plaque for the Founders Club. There's there's one who the name they wanted on there was definitely just a lot of eight equals 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 D's. Yeah, <laughs> and it's just like, uh, yeah, no, we're gonna spend thousands of dollars on this giant plaque that's guaranteed to last for centuries, and it's gonna have an ASCII w wanger on it. Okay. Yeah. All right, we. I mean, got yes, right. To... The answer is yes. Right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm going to I'm going to refuse to read the full name of the excrement and I'm only going to use the first letter so I will read I have peed myself. Uh, <laughs> uh okay, so we got to keep after thing and maybe 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 we'll forego picks for after thing today. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh all right. I'm going to count you in so we can get started in 3 <clears throat> Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello, hello, hello. Mr. Brian Brushwood. Yo! Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. Gentlemen, question for you. Yes. We're not going to do picks, but we're going to talk about books or things we've been reading that have influenced us a lot and just go around here and sort of hear each person say something. Uh, we, we, and, we, we touched real briefly on, on the main show. Um, uh, I'm so fascinated to hear. Brian, I'm flattered you call it the main show, but really it's called <laughs> Weird Things. <laughs> on Weird Things. You mentioned, I, 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 I got to admit, it's, it's a bit shocking to me that, um, uh, the, to hear that Matt Ridley didn't feel like he accomplished everything he had hoped to with The Rational Optimist, because that might be like a top five fundamental life-changing book for me. Uh, it's 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 so interesting. Um, that along with the righteous I'm mind and some paraphrasing others. and reading between the lines that I think that that he has made some wonderfully cogent arguments before. And I and I and I again I, I want to clarify like I think that for him I think it was a powerful book, but I think that he wanted to try to really sort of make this case sort of as a way to sort of do this 
And I think that that's what the new book, How Innovation Works, is really trying to get into the heart of how, you know, how innovation is what pulls us out of these things. Yeah, that uh, I guess uh, whenever somebody asks like for just a general recommendation, it was a magical year that I had that perfect trifecta of reading The Rational Optimist, followed by Abundance, and then the next book I read was Better Angels of Our Nature, uh, the Pinker book, and and I was mm -hmm. late to that one, um, and then and then later Thinking Fast and Slow or whatever. But but what a what a remarkable, just mind blowing one two three punch that was for me. Uh, in terms of of uh, and for the unfamiliar, we've talked about them a lot. Uh, but basically, the overall thesis is not only are things not as bad as you think, uh, they're better than they've ever been. Yes, including World War II. Like even if you loop in World War II in there, just objectively by every standard, everything is better than it's ever been. And it very much looks, if you look at the data and you were a betting person, that things are only going to get better from here, which is just a remarkable thing. And we need to clarify too, because every time we say this is people will just sort of get to the end of that statement and they won't read the rest of it. We're talking for people at the bottom. We're talking for people economically for the poorest people on the planet. And whenever we talk about, and that's an argument that Matt's made and others have made is like, when we talk of prosperity, we're not, we go, ah, and the rich get richer. Like, yeah, and the poor are getting things like running water and electricity, and these things are happening. Not as fast as we want, but the bottom 30% have had, have had their quality of life has improved dramatically over the last hundred years. And that's the thing that just frustrates me because every time we bring up like, oh, how look great, or I'd be like, oh, what about these people? Like, no, that's who we're talking about. Well, and I think that that's a general theme of, of, of understanding that you can appreciate a trend line while simultaneously uh, being able to like say that we should we should and can be better, right? Like, I, I think that that's something that gets conflated to me, uh, or gets conflated sometimes to say like, oh, things are better now than they've ever been. That's not the opposite of let's continue to make things better and all the pain points that we can point out. Yes, cool. Let's continue to go forward. If anything, this should only serve to say we can move mountains. We can continue to to create a more uh, a just society yeah it's the um uh, the recent parallel that i'd heard that stuck in my mind is uh, mercy and justice are not opposites of each other they 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 exist in parallel uh to each other yeah uh justin man you know the stuff that really stuck with me um we're talking about like things that really affected our affected our thinking and yeah. our lives. Yeah. Um, man, I've got one if you need some time. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm trying to just name a few of the. I mean, a, a lot of like political thought stuff. The writings of uh, Christopher Hitchens was really, really um, influential to me as you know somebody in my twenties. Not only for what his opinions were, but the confidence with which he wrote them in a way that made it very clear that yes, he wanted you to know that you could disagree with him, but you have not thought about this more than he has. <laughs> and, and that's like, th that is something that I have found to be not only in short supply, like, man, obviously for a million reasons, I wish he was still alive, but like, there are times where even as his health was failing him, uh, I, I Christopher Hitchens is just one of those minds I wish could see the flourishing of the social media age. Because, like, if it is possible, I feel like only his powers would have only grown stronger. <laughs> and and uh, it, it's it really influenced for me cuz he was really somebody that wanted to get out on a ledge and make a very specific pointed opinion and i don't necessarily think that i need to do that but i do think i need to have that same burden of don't let like don't let lack of preparation be the thing that sinks your argument like like uh, understand where every challenge is is going to come in 
because that's that's really the only thing that you need to make sure you batten down the hatches on is is understanding arguments from other sides and and researching your way through it. Uh man, I'm really glad to hear you phrase it that way because I spent um um a fair bit of yesterday sort of uh, uh making making plans for disasters that have not happened yet. And um uh, uh we we've, we've talked about how, you know, the 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 trope is that uh, uh Napoleon was not a great tactician. He just he just bothered to sit down and think about everything that could go wrong beforehand and then say, well, if then, you know, what will my plan be? And as a result, it looked like he came up with brilliant strategies in the moment. But of course, he had he had done it all in advance. And it's a weird thing to sit down and have arguments like, where could they get me? And even and, and in a weird way, if we could tie this into Hearthstone, <laughs> like uh, uh, playing Hearthstone yesterday, it was fun to say out loud, like, constantly um the way you win at hearthstone is by understanding what the other person hopes you're going to do and figure out the thing that if you were playing that deck and that archetype that would annoy you the most and then yeah. doing those things like even though it's not what you want to do because you're you're like well i want to play this way and what i want to do is this that you're like but i know that if i i was playing their deck I know what their motivations are, and I know that this is the move that would piss them off the most, and therefore it, you know, becomes the right move. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know. I like that sentiment of, of sort of uh, a pre-failing in imaginary scenarios and figuring out what what you would do different. And that's how I ended the podcast. <laughs> well, I can say one of the things to uh, touch on Hitchens is that he he thought his things through and it's like we talked about before like alex garland like i may not agree with the conclusion i may not agree and i don't know if there's anything where i disagree with like with alex garland's show devs although that's going to be bryce's pick as bryce wrote a book about how much he hated devs <laughs> yeah you know? it's fine it's fine he calls it the devs. Yeah, it's called devs it's <laughs> fine it's fine right. if you're if you're a big fat <laughs> dummy bryce castillo <laughs> With Hitchens was like, you would reach a thing, you're like, I don't know if I agree, but I felt that argument was so eloquently made that now I understand that other point to it. I understand that other side to it. And it just, that's, uh, that is sorely lacking. And, and, and we, we live in an environment where we don't really often want to entertain opposing points of view. You know, we just, we, our way to handle, you know, dif disposing different points of view is not to understand their arguments and to disagree with them on points. It's to just not hear the argument. Um, I know the beauty yeah. of Hitchens was like, and and you know I, I said this when he died, but if if you always agreed with Christopher Hitchens, you haven't read enough Christopher Hitchens. Like he yeah. would he would eventually find his way on the other side of your opinion. I, I feel like that's a mathematical certainty that that if you read him enough, you would come to a point in which you're like, oh, he's totally wrong on that. But it, it did it 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 laid a standard a standard that. I mean, and this is for him doing opinion writing that I think I've tried to carry on not only for PX3, but but Raise the Dead and, and stuff like that going forward, while also maintaining being, like, captivating. Christopher Hitchens knew very, very, very well where to bring in the human elements of, of a story to the point where, you know, I still remember. Like I, I, I define world elements by like uh, stories that Christopher Hitchens would tell in his writing because he understood that human heartbeat. Nice. Cool. Um, I've, I've got one. I, I go back to this mm, once or twice a year to listen to it. Um, it's a, uh, not exactly a lecture, but it's, it's kind of a, a lecture from Brian Moriarty uh, called the Secret of Psalm Forty Six. Uh, this is a, it's an hour long talk about. Um, uh, about game design and uh, the the relationship between creator and audience, uh, and he layers a lot of different stories um, that all kind of come come full circle by the end. You know his uh, his, his time working uh, at at Radio Shack and uh, how he would learn to code on the computers, but then also talking about like the battery of the month club and the sort of pointlessness and the 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 very uh, rote transaction going on between walk into the store 
go to the back of the store and get this awful lead battery that's not even fully charged and then walk out. You know, it's supposed to bring people in and it's supposed to make them look at the products. But at the end of the day, you just have these stores where once a month people come in and don't buy anything and don't get anything good. Uh, and, and that affects their experience. That's their experience. Um, and, and I hadn't realized until you said that just now that 90% of all my Radio Shack experiences was walking in, hoping that this time I'd find something irresistible and then not doing so. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I always was well, in love with the possibilities and always disappointed with the reality. Why well, I, I, I loved my Battery of the Month Club card as a kid because I had that and I had my Albertson's Cookie credit card too. Ooh. But the other thing too is Radio Shack had that. Remember that Superman comic book? They ended up being about like the TRS-80 or whatever they would put out. No, that sounds awesome. Oh yeah, that was another thing. So <laughs> sorry, Bryce, um, interrupt. And, and so he he emerges, uh, you know, that between talking about things that are awesome, aw dash some, you know, um, the the work uh, he spends a lot of time talking about the works of Bach, a lot of time talking about the Bible, a lot of time talking about William Shakespeare. He spends a lot of time talking about. Uh, and he prefaces it with the with the insanity of it, but he gives a very fair shake to like the author the the Shakespeare authorship issue, right? Like how does, oh whether or not it was actually who actually wrote it, it yeah. and and um and at the end of, at the end of it, I'll, I'll I'll cut to to the chase a little bit, but um the short the short thing that that you take away is like great things are generous and great things are giving, and that. Uh, influences a lot of, of of my work in terms of if I'm putting together a podcast, if I'm working on these shows, if I'm working on these videos, if we're coming up with ideas for things, and how uh, you know the the reason that we love these great works is not because they have a lot of depth, it's not because they have a lot of mystery or you know very sophisticated, deep, possible. Oh, Bach made all of these all of these rounds and he he hid all of these secret messages. It's because they were they were giving, you know. Uh, even on the surface level, they immediately gave you something that was incredible. And on top of that, they have all of these deeper deeper levels. Or, you know, in the case of the Bible, you know, he mentions like the Bible may have been the only book you had uh, in in when it, like for a lot of people, the Bible is is how they learn to read, how they learn to speak, um, and and. Those those are are thing those are great things not because they're large, um, and not because they're deep but because they are giving and so um, I, I I once or twice a year spend spend the time to listen to it it's really it's a really fantastic um, where, uh, where where can I go to make sure that I hear this um, we'll have it in the show notes here if you Google the secret of Psalm forty six uh, he's got a website uh, with an audio recording and a transcript uh, you can they've got, there's a version on YouTube. Um, I found out about it because it is an it itself is an Easter egg. This lecture about Easter eggs uh, is an Easter egg in the 2016 game The Witness, uh, where you have to sit and listen to it for one hour for the moon to very slowly oh, that's make funny. its way through a video. And so uh, I I really think it's it's just it is a great listen. You know he's a, he's a great speaker. Um, this most recent version of it from uh, whatever year I guess 2010 is like it's a very nice recording. Um, and it, and it itself is free. I think it is also, in that way, a generous uh, uh, story. I uh, um, I am unbelievably excited to hear this because uh, it touches on what I think will be a fairly significant part of whatever this book is. Uh, I'm I'm writing um, uh, that I've thought of as the bunny on the table. I don't know if I've talked about talked about this part, but um, uh, wherever we're at now. Um, uh, I always go back to the very, very beginning was trying to learn to street perform. You're on a street, you have traffic, you have eyeballs, you have a story, you're ready to perform. You got your fire eating sticks and your straight jacket and everything. All you need is somebody to start performing for. And, uh, and so I tried, you know, bluff and bluster. Hey, everybody gather around. We're about to have a show doing the ballet thing. Or, uh, I tried sincerely like, Hey, come on over here, do me a thing. Uh, but ultimately all of those amounted to some kind of cashing in 
before I had earned anything. And then the, the late years later, I read a book, uh, be a street magician by David Groves. And he started all of his street performing shows by just sitting casually behind a table with a deck of cards with a bunny rabbit on the table. And he would just wait. And sooner or later with all those eyeballs coming and going, uh, this self-contained unit of story, what I've come to th think of as the gift, the bunny on the table would engage someone and somebody couldn't resist and would come over of their own volition and start petting the the bunny rabbit. And then he that was the moment that he would casually say, uh, well, you know the rule. If you pet the bunny, you got to pick a card. And all of a sudden, after they, the fact they realized they'd already self-selected and engaged, and and he what a small ask to pick a card. And before you knew it, he's doing a, a trick for two people that it's easy to have more people gather around. And then suddenly you're up to, you know, 70 people in a giant circle and you're wrapping up your street performance show and making money. So the idea of like, what is the gift? What is the, the single self-contained unit of story that you are giving to the world has, has always been uh, long before you harvest that goodwill or attention has always resonated with me. So I, I can't believe that we haven't talked about this, yeah. but before this, I, I'm really excited to take a listen. Yeah. I think, I think all three of you would really get a kick out of listening to the secret of Hell Psalm yeah. 46. It's cool. great. It is. Cool. It's, uh, it's very easy to listen to. Also. Andrew, do you have one? I, yeah, I do. Um, I love, I love to read large books and things like this, but often I don't finish them. You know, you pick up like a 400 page book that's on a particular topic and it's exciting. And often you get the sort of the basic thesis and the rest of it is sort of reinforcing that. And I don't have patience. And I admit that for a guy that, you know, tries to be informed and stay on top of things, I don't finish a lot of books. I just don't, I get sort of get into it. And then I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going to move on because one, maybe my attention span two, I think the way books are written for the book market, et cetera. But also, though, sometimes you really want to get into a subject and you want to kind of dive deep and it can be intimidating. One of the things that I try to do is I try to find the least intimidating way to get into it. When I wanted to get into understand like neural networks and artificial intelligence, I would go find like beginners, like basic beginner books, things like that with pictures and, you know, cartoons. And I'd watch YouTube videos and stuff just because like I don't want to be like, oh, no, I know this. I got this. I'm going to just start as a blank slate and get into it. When I wanted to get into uh you know, evolutionary psychology, things like this. The book that I read first, the book that sort of got me into understanding or looking looking at consciousness, not necessarily understanding it, but at least understanding the arguments. There are books by Daniel Dennett that I love that are bigger, better, whatever, Darwin's dangerous idea, et cetera. But a book he wrote, which was part of a series, which I thought was a fantastic series, uh, was the Science Master series. Uh, Richard Dawkins wrote, wrote uh, River Out of Eden, which I really recommend. It's a great book to read before you go into The Blind Watchmaker because it's most of the big arguments there and 196 pages instead of like, you know, 500. Daniel Dennett's book, Kinds of Minds Towards an Understanding of Consciousness. It's 196 pages and it is some of Daniel Dennett's best philosophical writing at the time, which is it was like 30 years ago now. And he's had a lot more amazing thoughts and stuff since then. And he gets into things like talking about like, you know, your, your arm has neurons, your arm senses pain. If you get into a car accident, and you have to reattach the arm, should, it, should you anesthetize the arm? Because there is an experience of, you know, he builds up these sort of like these philosophical arguments and how wonderful philosophers do. And that sounds like a silly example as I give it, but when you read it, you understand the context. No, talk dude, about dude, like, I'm sorry, I, I, you're acting like it's a throwaway. My mind is already blown. Like, like oh my God, yeah. to what extent uh, is the pain conscious in my arm that is severed from my body? And then he gets into, and he has a lot of these, and that's what I love about Daniel Dennett is he has these wonderful ways of looking at these things where it, it's not necessarily you have to agree with his conclusions, but his arguments, his philosophical arguments, like, well, let's look at it like this and let's explore where this goes. Because if we worry about like the pain that a lobster feels, you know, but it, it doesn't have this pain center, but it does have these, what about this or what about that? And not, therefore you're wrong, but more of like just this, but he is, he is one of my favorite people in philosophy, particularly in consciousness, et cetera, because his arguments, and, and I mean his, his, his thought puzzles, his thought experiments, his thought experience, let's use that term, are wonderful. And, and I think that it is a great, great, great example. Kinds of Minds, I thought it was a great example of that. And once you get into that, then you can start getting into other stuff by him. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of wonderful books in that series. There's The Periodic Kingdom, which is a wonderful overview of you know how he came up with the uh 
you know, the periodic table. I mean, just great, great stuff. And just that basic book series. I'm a big fan. I wish there was more like it. It's easily digestible. You can you can finish them in one or two sittings and you walk away with a deeper understanding and then you're really well prepared to pick up a topic and go into it at a deeper level. Right on. So. Nice. I sent you all the image though of the uh, the the Radio Shack comic, the, uh, it's so the great. Superman. So funny. Yeah, uh, the the computer that saved Metropolis, the TRS-80 feature computer whiz kids <laughs> and Superman, you know, dealing with a hurricane. So, um just wow. just lovely just lovely simpler times when a trash ad <laughs> can save the world look at that yeah. tv computer tv computer <laughs> oh price uh, you'll never uh, know the joy of 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 when a uh, uh an audio tape uh cassette player attached to a commodore uh 64 <laughs> finally finished uploading beachhead i mean it's like yeah oh my gosh yeah, waiting, waiting a half an hour to play Frogger. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> it's been after. Hey, good stuff. Everybody. Good times, man. Uh, that was actually a really good fix, Andrew, uh, considering, like, like, let's not do picks. Let's just do all picks. Uh, that ended yeah. up being really good. That was a lot of fun. Um, all righty, cool. everybody. We got a jet so that these boys can eat some mac and cheese. <laughs> it's just too accurate. <laughs> and uh, come back and do the happy hour. See, in see you in 20. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. See you guys. <laughs>